Yo, what's good? Welcome to Observing the Process. Before we start, I'm hoping you can help me out by supporting the show. You can rate and review it on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen. You can share it with your friends, you can blog about it, or discuss it on your own podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, you can subscribe to my channel and like this video, or you can support it directly. You can do this by going to my website. I'll leave a link in the description. Thank you for supporting the show. Listeners like you make it possible. Today on the show, I had Mark Rassang. Mark is a filmmaker and photographer based around Asia. We talk a lot about the video production industry in China and a bunch of his travel stories. We also talk about his experience filming a documentary about Mount Everest. The documentary is called Too High to Fall, and Mark was a DP for the project. It's an incredible story, and I'm very grateful he shared it on the show. Please give it up for Mark Rassang. In the land of China... Got nothing at all. No possessions. And in China, they never go to church. No religion, too. I do not. Well, it's easy if you try. Baby. Three, two, one. Okay, we're live. Mark, how are you doing? Thanks for coming over. Hey, thanks for having me. Of course, of course. Um, recently on Vimeo, I just saw. I guess it's already been out for a month, but the Rebel Riders documentary. Right. Um, can you tell me about that? Like, how did it get started? I know it's about, um, obviously, in Indonesia, and um, these guys kind of, like, building bikes, and specifically from Vespa, which I thought was pretty interesting. Right. Yeah. yeah, so it all started when a friend of mine from Indonesia, a photographer named Mohamed Fatli, mm. he did a whole series about these guys on a bike, on their bikes. Um and it was something that I've never seen before. And doing some research, there wasn't really that much that I could find mm -hmm. about it. It was all like really local, some small bits from like Vice Indonesia or mm -hmm. like newspaper clippings. But no one really ever did a video around it that um, really translated the whole craziness mm -hmm. about it. Um, so decided to go out there and see what it was like. And after first initial trip, um, started building on a concept, tried to find sponsors and send it to places like Vice or not Geo, but no one seemed to be really interested in getting it done. Mm. So in the end, I ended up doing everything uh, on my own dime. And then it, um, earlier this year, Dan came along as well dan who was on the podcast earlier yeah yeah um, dan agarafi yeah <laughs> shout out um so he came along and we tried to film as much as possible for a week and then realizing that in indonesia you can't really do much in only a week's time hmm. so we planned to shoot a festival which didn't work out because we weren't allowed to get in hmm. to the festival for being foreigners. Really? So this festival is going to like be based in Indonesia? Like, yeah. Oh, okay. it's, it was supposed to be, or it is, uh, Indonesia's biggest festival meetup. Hmm. So we were planning this whole shoot around that. And then getting to the festival, we found out that because it's held on a military air base, we were not allowed to enter as wow. foreigners. Not even allowed to enter. So maybe it wasn't even like they didn't want you to participate, but just like the where, the place they were holding it was just like, no. Yeah. It was Damn. just off limits. And we found some other foreigners there from, you know, coming over from Jakarta to uh, Bandung, which is a few hours outside of Jakarta. Mm. And they also weren't allowed to go in. So yeah, there was just no way we would have been able to do it. Mm. So just going back and forth a lot and trying to call whoever would be able to help, but didn't work out. So we had to go with plan B and just hit up people on Instagram mm. and try and find where they're based. And if we could shoot anything with them in the like three days that we had left. Mm. Just trying to like finish it up. You're talking about like, yeah, get more content. Like you were, you felt like you were missing some pieces. Or? Right. Cause the whole video would have like sort of revolved around people building their bikes, getting it ready and going to this huge uh, festival. Oh, okay. So, so that, that was the, like the story in your head yeah. like before it's done, obviously is they're going to this festival, mm -hmm. but, um, yeah, the way it ends, as I remember, it's just kind of like, uh, 
this is what we do. This is who right. we are. More yeah. of an individual. It is everyone like, does their own thing. Yeah, we're creative. This right. is like our creative outlet. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. So yeah, some questions people on Instagram and myself had is like, okay, so you already mentioned Mohammed. You had as a friend and that's your homie who like introduced you to the scene. But then even you know, the process of gaining trust, because I think a documentary takes so much work to gain trust and really forming a unique bond with the subject of your right. doc. So what was that like? Did, did it take a long time or did it feel pretty natural or? Um, so a big problem was the language barrier. Mm. Um, we got a fixer for all the locations to help us out, just getting in touch and um, just communicating in general mm -hmm. because doing interviews was quite tricky when you're not quite sure what you're going to get. And yeah. if the answer that you're getting is actually uh, fitting nicely into the story. So yeah. um, that was the only way to do it. And then besides that, just trying to hit up these crews on Instagram and see if they were responsive. Uh, yeah, to, that that was a really cool part of it actually was um, you had one scene for sure in there where it was like a guy scrolling through his Instagram kind of like, right. It, so there's a community of these people and they use Instagram and that's how they communicate to really like kind of, oh, this is what I got going on right, right. now. And this, and yeah. it, it seems to be like quite limited to Indonesia because huh. there are these huge communities that have like 50,000 followers, yeah. but it's mostly limited to people in Indonesia that know about it. That's crazy. Because outside of Indonesia, it's virtually unheard of to do this style of like reconfiguration of Vespa right. bikes. And yeah. that was something that was so weird. It's like for in, in general, the, the Vespa motor, is that what kind of um, makes it so configurable and customizable? Or did you know anything about that going into it or like why they chose Vespa motors in particular? Right. Or So it's more like Indonesia has a history with Vespa um, as a brand mm. since the, 50s mm -hmm. so there's a lot of really cheap vespa parts floating around right just like recyclable like yeah recycling, yeah and you can get a, a secondhand vespa for like a hundred dollars wow probably not working very well but enough to it's good for to, parts yeah yeah get some pieces out of it yeah i saw this one on jerry seinfeld has this show on uh, netflix mm -hmm. and it's like comedians in cars getting coffee yeah. and in one episode he actually chose a Vespa for his guest and they drove right. around and they, they always give a little background and yeah, the Vespa was huge, like revolutionary. The Italians, I guess made mm -hmm. it. And, um, you know, they, for some, like they didn't want to use cars and they were the first ones to really stylize the, the vehicle, like the moped right. to make it, you know, attractive and mm -hmm. people want to use it. And I don't know, like design nerds were like, wow, this is revolutionary. And that's kind of cool that it, it ends up in yeah. Indonesia. <laughs> like now there's some dudes just right. like modifying them. And for anyone who's listening, you got to go watch it because the stuff they come up with is so crazy. Like, like 10 wheels are just like, I don't know. I thought the creativity was kind of cool and it, it almost, it's cool that they're just doing it for the sake of doing it. And there's no brand or company that's really come in and monetized it yet. Yeah. It I seems very pure. I don't really know how like Piaggio feels about it hmm. for people to modify it in a way that's definitely not safe. Yeah. Definitely um, not safe. It's like you see like the electrical cords hanging up the handlebars right. and stuff like that. So gnarly. Sometimes there's just no brake, no lights. You'll mm. have these guys using their cell phones in the dark to like indicate that they're driving on the road. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. That's pretty sketchy. Yeah. So obviously there's also a lot of accidents happening with it. Yeah. Um, I bet. It's a bit of the dark side of that whole Vespa community is that mm. there is a lot of like drinking and driving and unsafe driving right. and accidents do happen a lot. Mm. Um, but that would have just been a bit too difficult to fit that in the video without overshadowing the whole yeah. thing. I, I think the angle you chose was good. I, I liked seeing the positive side of it. And yeah, of course there's going to be a negative side to kind yeah. of anything you could document. But Right. It would fit in if it would be like a longer version. Definitely. But well, okay. So the next thing that was in, like, we were out to dinner once talking about this before it came out. And, um, you had mentioned like you're going through the process of trying to sell it mm -hmm. and figure out. And for me, that was interesting. And even right now, it still seems like you have something 
that you could sell. Like mm-hmm. you could continue to add on to this if you wanted to and yeah. create an even larger dock. It's, it's, and like for me during that dinner, it, it really opened my eyes to like how stuff happens and it's a way longer road than I really would want it to be <laughs> like, right. you know, so I, th- if you want to, I, I think listeners would really benefit like myself included the process of documentary filmmaking and like how long it is. And because for me, I've never, well, I've wanted to make this and I've wanted to get sponsors, but like, it's not like you get a sponsor from the go and then you build it. It's right. kind of like you have to have proof of concept. Yeah. So would you agree with that or? Yeah. And it's definitely like documentary uh, photography or filmmaking is not for the money. Mm. You need to really find something intrinsically interesting to obsess about. Mm. Cause like, for example, this project was just a year long obsession of the first thing you think about when you wake up and the last thing you think about when you're trying to sleep. Wow. Um, so that's definitely, it takes a toll mm. and it still needs to be fun in the end. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, awesome. So I think I usually wait a little while to go into this segment of the show, but it's called like Instagram lurk where I, uh, (laughs) go deep into my guests, Instagram. And, um, we kind of just like jump off of stories. So for you, one of your first photos has an iPhone three GS. So I I have one of these, so you can open it up and see what the first photo is and kind of tell people what's going on. Oh, wow. Yeah. (laughs) So I don't even remember this. I guess it's just testing out my phone, huh? <laughs> but what I found so funny, I th- I think that's an iPhone 3GS in the photo yeah, that you're taking. Looks like it. Yeah, and then um, yeah, it's just back in like 2011. It's just a selfie, pretty much. Yeah. So, do you were you in China at that point, or? I think so. I yeah. got to China in August 2011, mm. and I think that was still before Instagram got banned. Oh, probably. Yeah. 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 So, and like for people listening, like there's like one of those classic IG retro filters, like with the square on it and all that stuff. Black square, white (laughs) border. Yeah. Yeah. That was a, that was a while ago. (laughs) Yep. So that's the first photo you can go to the right. And then I have another photo. Um, so I think, which one is that? Um, the shots on the bar. Yeah. Shots on the bar. So I don't know if this is this project, but something a friend told me to mention is um, Shanghai Nightlife Series. Yeah, Is that like part of this at all or is that like way before that? No, this is part of it, but it was also something that I didn't really start out as a project itself. Mm. It was more that when I first moved to Shanghai, I was working in nightlife Mm. just to like party, meet people and make a little money on the side. Sure. Definitely not enough money, Mm. but um, it was, in retrospect, a very interesting time in Shanghai uh, in terms of how much crazy shit was going on. Mm. Um, So I I did this nightlife photography thing for about four years total. And was it was with a company or a sponsored company or? It started off with like the first company I was interning for in the beginning. Mm. And then it just... um, just went freelance mm. and started working for like Smart Shanghai and some clubs directly. Right. Um, and I ended up at some points going out four or five times a week. So after four years, I was pretty much done with that. Yeah. I mean, like I've done some nightlife photography myself and um, it's it's kind of draining. Like You have to be in the right frame of mind yeah. to want to be out there. And the question, I, like for me, what what camera were you using? Uh, mostly like a Canon five D mm. series with uh, like ultra wide lens. So so a rather big body, because yeah. because for me, I found like, um, I've done uh, nightlife photography with like you know a standard big body like that EOS that mm-hmm. film camera has been really fun. Yeah, but like. Okay, so I guess where I'm going is like the bigger the camera, it, it can play in two different ways. Sometimes you have a really big camera, right. with the flash, and it's like people know you're the photographer, and it's like that can actually make a difference. People want to get their photo taken, and right. you know what I mean? Like it shows something. But when you have like a small camera, sometimes they're like, why are you taking photos of me? And like right. they don't understand. So is that something you would consider, like the, the camera you would use, or did that uh, not matter too much? I think it's more about the strategy of right. taking photos. Mm. 
just hanging around people that seem like they have something going on. Mm. And then I usually would just hold my camera pretty low. Right. So people couldn't really see it. Mm -hmm. And then when the moment's happening, just, you know, snipe, take it out and take a few flash shots. Right. Yeah, and that yeah. usually worked. People weren't always happy with it, but, mm -hmm. you know, just got to get the shot. Yeah, Shanghai looks like a pretty wild place. So, so like this started in 2011, 2010? Or? Yeah, and I think that was also around the time where people were not as concerned with uh, their online presence. Mm. So people were just still happy to sh like get their photo taken completely shit-faced because they know it wouldn't just pop up on like the club's WeChat account. Mm, yeah, because WeChat didn't even exist yeah. back then. I think it was like just when WeChat started coming up, but wow. not everyone had like good mobile internet anyways. Hmm. It's around the time where they still had the taxi hotlines. A taxi hotline? Oh, like yeah. to call. And yeah, like, you it's know. like the English translation service Damn. hotline. Yeah, that's pretty wild. Damn. Yeah, so before we go even deeper into this timeline, I think actually it could be kind of good to go back to where you're from and your experience. Uh, you're Dutch, right? Yeah. So yeah. What, what part? Near Amsterdam. Near Amsterdam. Yeah. Okay. And um, yeah, what was that like growing up in Amsterdam? Like hobbies, interests? Like was well, what, photography yeah. a big hobby back then or? Not really. Mm. Um, so it was like a suburb of Amsterdam. Okay. Not really Amsterdam itself. Um, pretty quiet. And then when I was around 11 years old, I moved to Belgium, mm -hmm. like a suburb of Antwerp. Okay. So basically my elementary high school years were all pretty quiet mm -hmm. didn't really travel much didn't do any photography at all and then once i went to college signed up for um i did study international business so at least with that i could get in touch with people that were not just from holland or belgium because mm -hmm. i feel like if you don't do that you'll probably end up in a bubble of people that just you know live and work in the same place yeah, and don't definitely. really they still travel but they don't really connect with people that aren't from their background mm, definitely yeah i find um, when i studied abroad for the first time it really opened my eyes to connecting with a diverse group of people can make such a big difference on your outlook and the yeah. type of work you can produce yeah and i studied uh marketing well not international business but marketing and um I mean, like, I feel like I use that today. I, it kind of works well with, you know, social media and marketing yourself as a, a creative, like right. for me, like photographer, video, whatever I want to do. That, that is a good background to have. And I use it for that, but not in the traditional sense of like using it for a brand, which is what right. I think I was studying, you know, like marketing for a brand or working for mm -hmm. a company. But in the end, it still is valuable to me to use that kind of stuff. Yeah. I think the most interesting aspect was still just like cross-cultural um, awareness or communication. Mm. And what university was this? Like the University of Rotterdam. Oh, Rotterdam. Yeah. I know Rotterdam. I've heard of it. Like yeah. it's kind of like the next city in close to Amsterdam, like that people yeah. would go to if, right. Yeah. 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 I have a this dude catfish who's like a professional BMXer and he would go there on trips. If he wasn't at Amsterdam, right. He would be at Rotterdam. Yeah. It's it a very just, different city, but it's mm. only an hour away by train. Yeah. And I think what, what I was surprised to learn is that like apparently, you know, weed and the prostitution and all that stuff is only really legal in Amsterdam. It's not really legal outside of Amsterdam. Like they use it as tourism, yeah, right? Is that true? Or It's still legal in most places, but mm. um, I guess in Amsterdam, it's just more prominent. Okay. Like everything is downtown. Mm. I think in Rotterdam, everything is a little bit more spread out. Mm. Maybe just not as like branded and fully like f flashing lights. Yeah. Steez, you know? It was also because Rotterdam got um, almost completely destroyed in the second world war. Oh, okay. So Amsterdam has a lot more of that, you know, classic European mm. appeal. Right. So it's more authentic to the, the like just culturally it's yeah. older, right. different feeling. Yeah. Did you ever, um, if you grew up close to Amsterdam, what was that like? Is it like, in America, they think like, oh, if it's legal, like kids are just going to start smoking at such a young age. Mm -hmm. Or do, do you have any thoughts on that? Like the experience growing up with it just kind of like around? Um, it was always just around. I feel like Americans still 
smoke a lot more than Dutch people. That's what I'm saying. That's what I would imagine. It's kind of like that feeling like, oh, I can't have it. So I want it more. Right. So I think if like you, you like, for example, like Italian kids or French kids, like they have wine at the dinner table when they're 11 or 12, mm-hmm. just like a little sip. No, it's like, it's not like a taboo thing, yeah. but when you don't allow it until you're 21, of course you're like itching for it when you're right. 18, 19 and like jumping into it. So I've always found that, that style of going about it. Interesting. Yeah. I, I think it's cool. I think also growing up in Belgium, it was always just around in Belgium because hmm. you could just drive across the border and yeah, it's not, it's not that far away. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So after college, wh- what's, what goes on then? Like, do you, is there something in between China and college or? Um, I went to Hong Kong for an exchange semester, hmm. which was interesting. And I really liked Hong Kong back then. When was that? 2010. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so pretty close to yeah. getting into China. Yeah. Hong Kong is, um, I was just there this past weekend and actually it's amazing how like of a different culture it feels like even it, it's so close right. or, I mean, is it China, whatever Yeah. It, it's, it's still, feel, it feels like a different culture and mm-hmm. it, it's interesting how like the architecture and the people, it's so much more international. It, even mm-hmm. though I feel Shanghai is very international, it's like, Hong Kong is really international right. with the type of people you see and interact interact with. And yes, how long were you there for? Um, just five months. Okay. Yeah, and I used to love it back then, but every time I go back now, it's just too claustrophobic for me. That's what I'm saying. Like, there's something that like about me that like I want to like it a lot, mm-hmm. but it feels like just like too much almost. It, right. It's strange. Like, I don't know. I I. Shanghai seems like the perfect mixture of it's not too Beijingy where it's so spread out, yeah. but it's not too Hong Kong where it's like people are on top of people and you're always like the architecture is insane. Like you're walking up like little stairs every moment. <laughs> like it, 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 I guess it's like, you know, it's built on a mountain pretty yeah. much. So that makes sense, but it's, it's just a totally strange feeling. Right. And extremely like narrow sidewalks. Yeah. That you don't want to be on during rush hour or lunch break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. So you, what did you do there? Like, were you just studying or? Yeah, studying sort of. Wasn't much studying involved. Right. For me too, like party when you go yeah. study abroad. Yeah, just an excuse to to see the world, travel, party. Mm-hmm. Like every chance you get, you'll just do a trip outside of Hong Kong because, sure. you know, Philippines is close. Yeah. China is close. Mm-hmm. Um. I think the most interesting thing is just meeting a lot of people from all over Mm -hmm. um, and people that are in the same mindset. Like no one's there to, or a lot of people are not really there to study, but it's more to just broaden your perspective, meet people from other places. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I still keep in touch with a lot of these people. Um, And I think they're all all quite interesting. Mm Mm-hmm. So that's your first introduction to yeah. Asia. That's interesting. And then um, stay there for five months. At what point do you go back? And then like, you did you graduate? And what's the transition from graduation to Yeah, I then just China? finished up and got out as soon as possible. Yeah. Of just, the Netherlands. Yeah, or, just because like once, or... once you've seen what the world has to offer, just yeah. like go out and get it, especially when you're young. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely the same thing for me. Like I studied abroad in Australia and then it's almost like I can't remember what I was thinking before I studied abroad. Like, was I interested in the rest of the world? I, I it seems like I, I should have been, but I really think f- really leaving your continent yeah, and, and going to somewhere like completely new, even if it's Australia, which is very similar culture. Like, well, you know what? I also traveled to Thailand when mm-hmm. I was on that break. So seeing that kind of stuff was like, yeah, got to get out right yeah. after I graduate. And then, yeah, I just got introduced to China through work. Right. So what about for you? Like when you graduate, did you, were you, did you feel pressure to find a job after you graduated or? Not really. But mm-hmm. like money is always a thing. Of course. Um, but then it's also the original plan was for me to go to grad school mm. and get a master's degree in marketing. Okay. But then just decided that I should at least, you know, do something useful, uh, start off with an internship. Mm. Uh, thought Hong Kong would be the right place for it, but then there's just nothing remotely creative happening in Hong Kong, mm. in like on an internship level. 
So Shanghai was the next yeah. best thing. Right. When we were even in Hong Kong, we met up with a friend who's a designer and she's like, yeah, Hong Kong is just not a creative city. It's like right. all about finance yeah. and it's just not the place. So yeah, Shanghai. It's, it's not a fun place to be on a budget either. No. Because <laughs> I don't want to live in a shoebox. Literally a shoebox. Like I've seen, I think some vice doc or someone that they are cages. Some people are actually living in cages, like in right. these apartment buildings. It's scary claustrophobic. Yeah. And just hearing stories from people that, you know, that do live there and how much they spent on rent. Mm. Um, mm. It's just not worth it. Mm. So yeah, Shanghai, you, you move there to find an internship or. Yeah. I just ended up with an internship here with a like nightlife startup company. Okay. So like, this is where we jump back to yeah. the beginning. And then it's also like Shanghai still has a good platform and it used to be a lot, um, I think more flexible for startups that weren't like as well, um, like had good fundamentals. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So it was like people, not a good foundation. Yeah, yeah. People having like a wild idea and then just running with it for, you know, as long as possible. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I've heard stories. It just it was like the wild wild west. Of just yeah. you can kind of run with anything. It was right. a different time. Yeah, you can convince anyone to like put some money into yeah. it. Yeah, there's. I mean, there still is money floating around right now to do crazy stuff. But yeah. from the people that I've had on my show, it's just like 2000 to 2010 was just you know a money grab for brands, just like throwing money at anyone who wanted to do anything. Right, and you still see it with some like especially F and B stuff. Mm-hmm. how there's bars opening and closing in like the same season dude it's crazy so so much of that so yeah getting involved in that when you're fresh out of school is not that great because then you're at the you know low end pecking order yeah and you just have to do all the dirty work sure and sort of uh acknowledge your seniors as you know wise men that yeah. know everything and you know don't worry about getting paid <laughs> even Dude, when this ship is sinking yeah i mean like that's such a problem with the i think the creative industry is that like it feels like something that um or for most people it is like i love to do this anyways mm-hmm. so like even if i don't get paid i still want to do this so then it, it, you have to eventually figure out like your value how much you're worth and be comfortable asking for that and that's a hard thing that I think I've gotten a lot better at, but it takes time. Yeah. So especially you're, you're wide eyed going in as an internship. Like you don't know what to do. Yeah. And it's also recognizing the type of characters that you'll encounter. Mm. Like people that are just overconfident and full of like empty promises, yeah. for example. Yeah. That's uh, everyone has run into those. And if you haven't yet, you will. <laughs> yeah. And especially in photography and video work, it's always about, you know, the promise of exposure. Mm. And in oh, the end, yeah. you're just doing people, you're giving people free work. Right. So. Yeah. This dude, um, design directors or something on Instagram, he has this funny video up recently where it's like, this is a, a video of me, um, eating, uh, with all of the money I earned from my, uh, exposure. And it's just like, he's cooking with nothing. Like there's right. no, <laughs> it's, like, it's like, yeah, thanks for the exposure. Yeah. It really doesn't do anything. Like today, everyone, like. Nah, the exposure you, you, cause it's funny. Like you get the exposure from paid work too. Like they, there's, they still have to credit you when you do paid work. Right. Like, so it's a bit of a catch 22 cause you still need to get the portfolio to get mm-hmm. the paid work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For me, I do see some value in doing free work for a short period of time. Like, right. yes, if you don't have a portfolio, you're going to have to do some stuff. Like for me, I interned at push for six months for basically free until like then I was like more than an intern and like doing real editing work and you yeah. know you work your way up you gotta ha- if you want to really do it the best thing you can do is have some type of mentor to be like yo like you put in your time explain to them now like this is when money needs to come into play I guess yeah and you gotta make sure that all these efforts are working towards a goal that you have in mind mm, definitely so it's not just like lost energy mm. So after Shanghai Nightlife, I guess that's like an ongoing project. It lasted like four years or what? tell me more about that. Yeah. So like doing that for four years and then sort of cataloging everything and making a selection of just the craziest 
shit that's been happening. Mm. Decided to just call it quits after four years and then put together um, a little exhibition, which was like a a one night only thing mm. somewhere in a, the former basement six. Basement six. Yeah. Before my time, buddy. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was like the first location of basement six and then they still moved once or twice. Oh, really? Um, it was just some like shelter type like club or yeah, it's like shelter, one of those underground bomb shelters. It's in crazy an apartment building. Damn, yeah. Tell people about that because like I don't know. Sh- to me, shelter was crazy. That was the only yeah. Thing. So around the whole city of Shanghai and I guess Beijing and a few other cities to have these like nuclear bomb shelters, mm-hmm. which are technically owned by the government or military. And some of them have been repurposed. Um, I guess Shanghai had Shelter, which is a club. Mm-hmm. Um, then Basement 6, which was an art gallery in one of those bomb shelters. And then in Beijing, you have a couple where there's just converted into apartments. Yeah. Just people living underground. No wow. light. I didn't know about that yeah. in Beijing. So Pete, they converted some of the bomb shelters into apartments in Beijing. Yeah. Well, apartments is a big word. Just, <laughs> a living space. Yeah. Even living space is like a stretch. Right. But, um, There's oxygen. and Yeah, I didn't even, I mean, I guess it makes sense. Like they were literal bomb shelters. Like when I went down into shelter, it was so crazy. Like you are in an actual bomb shelter and right. you're partying with like all this loud music and lights. and Yeah, those are the golden nightlife years. Yeah, I, I, I call it like the last year. I, I say that I think on every single episode, but... <laughs> It's my claim to fame. I caught one one last yeah. year, 2015, I feel like. was like, and they had like shelter and Arkham at the original Arkham and Lola. Yeah. But uh, so Basement Six, this was, uh, I never experienced Basement right. Six. Well, it was a pretty small setup, um, mostly because I think the art scene in Shanghai is either very highbrow or just not really well put together at all. Hmm. Because some of the stuff just seems kind of kitschy, but there yeah. doesn't seem to be like a fully, or there's very little of that, you know, organic art scene that isn't pretentious. I feel you. Yeah. Um, I think highbrow is a, a good way to put it. Like, it's just like, they're too, almost too good for going to an underground club right. sometimes. It's like power station of art and everything where they basically pump millions of dollars yeah. into getting, you know, big names. Mm. Yeah. You know, I was surprised. I went to Beijing maybe a month or two ago and they had this, it's like an equivalent of Mogunshan or M50, seven, eight, nine, I think. Right. That was way more popping than M50 is, which I found, I don't know if you've been there recently or if you, yeah, for me, I was surprised that the Beijing like art space was really well utilized compared Mm. to what they do here in Shanghai. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever interact with M50 much or do you really? Not much. It just seems like it's a lot of independent galleries. Um, But I think the problem is that it's all clustered together. Mm. So they're all competing for, you know, foot traffic rather than um, getting real good original content Mm. out. Yeah. First for me, it, it just, it's one of those things where it feels artificial yeah. Where like an art space really shouldn't feel artificial, I guess. Yeah. There's what? no real community around it. It's yeah. just like an, a gallery owner that sells stuff. Yeah. But there's no, you know, artists don't go there. I think it used to be a, a really well utilized place. Like maybe 15 years ago, yeah. someone was telling me they went there often. And then when they came back for their trip, like in the, in the past five years, they're like, what is going on? Like I, this used to be like yeah. so good. And now it's just Well, even the used. graffiti walls that used to be around it was a good hangout mm, yeah. but then once that's gone there's no real reason to go there unless you know someone's serving free booze right <laughs> yeah that's so funny man like <laughs> for me and like my skater friends that used to be such a reason like we would somehow just always know, like when i first got here you know liquid laundry yeah like they had a night where it's just like free beer all night <laughs> like they would just do that like and this right. was like high quality like IPAs or something yeah. t- like they brew their own beer there and it's like free beer until the kegs run out and we would get there the second it opens and I think we would be responsible for finishing half the beer like me and 10 right. of my friends and like that was crazy and I think that was going on for 15 years 15 forever like yeah 
And then it just kind of, those free things kind of faded out. Yeah. Do you, do you have I any was, memories? Yeah. yeah. Um, back when 88 was still a thing. Club 80, 88. Yeah, I don't even know. No. Um, yeah, that, they got converted into, I think, two different clubs afterwards. Hmm. But that was the main sort of kitschy Chinese club to hang out and get free booze just because you're a foreigner. Right. I. <laughs> so funny. I used to get high, paid to go like as a model, like right. to be. <laughs> There's your table. There's yeah, your complimentary they give you a bottle. Table, they give you a free bottle. And um, it was so funny. My friend who introduced me to it, his name was Kevin. And um, he's like, yeah, they, like come with me. Like they'll pay you to come here. And we get there and they're like, you're okay to me. Cause I'm like literally just at six foot. Right. And for some reason that night he's like five ten. like, you're not good. <laughs> so the guy who introduced me to it, like, and then it sucked though. Cause I was by myself. I have to, you have to stay there until like two in the morning. And like, yeah, it's fun if you have a big group of people around you, yeah. but if you don't really know, there's other like kind of like Russians or just like, right. like people that I just don't know that are involved in this scene and they pay you 200 RMB to each other. Eventually I just like sat in the back. And just like waited until I yeah. could leave. And yeah. Did you ever do that kind of stuff? Um, uh, Not paid just yeah. for free booze. Right. So like you would go to clubs and they'd just let you in for free. Was that the deal? Yeah. Or? It seemed like it was, it was always just like a WeChat message being sent around. It was like, come to this club right now. Right. Free booze. Yeah. Yeah. For people who, I mean, to my understanding, to my feeling, I don't think it's really like this anymore, but back in the day, they, like business owners thought you would build a ton of hype for your club if there's a, a bunch of foreigners right. there like on opening you, maybe you can tell the story like if you agree with that or yeah i i think it was always uh well most chinese clubs are all like table service there's mm. no real dancing mm. so then all the standing tables are for walk-in customers that don't want to buy bottles right and the foreigners so you put them in the middle of the club so everyone can see mm-hmm. um just so it looks international yep. and pop in and supposedly would attract more people to come to the club and spend more money on bottles. Yeah. I think that's exactly what it was. They, they thought like, okay, for the first couple weekends, you know, we'll get recap photos. There'll be a bunch of foreigners in the right. photos. They're all having a good time. And then like everyone else, Oh, that's the club to go to. It's called fusion. I think by, um, in Lao Ximin, like, you know, or sorry, Shin T and D. Yeah. Anyways, that was a club that I experienced this at. But you're yeah. saying this was at 88 was one of your first Yeah, well, 88 was like the no- notorious one just because uh-huh. it was so kitschy. Like a whole steampunk vibe around it. Yeah. And uh, yeah, every time I'd go with my buddy, we just get a bottle of whiskey for free. With, so funny. Like, no <laughs> obligations. Finish a bottle and get out. Yeah, dude. Uh, I mean, like... that's Just fun when you're 21. It's awesome when you're 21, man. That's like a dream. Like <laughs> it's like you're treating like a celebrity in a yeah. sense. Even if it's might be fake alcohol. Dude, that was something I was gonna ask. Like friends of mine would say, like, there is fake alcohol. Maybe it is true that fake alcohol is floating around, but like, yeah. what does it even mean to be fake? Like Um, uh, well, it's not like the the stuff that makes you blind. It's more that they'll have a bottle of um like Jack Daniels, for example, and they'll just refill it with cheaper off right. shelf uh, bourbon. Mm, that makes and sense. Pass it off as you know, Jack Daniels for two dollars. <laughs> yeah, man. They the business people out here. They know how to make a buck. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the whole city is a hustle. So <laughs> that's true. The whole city is a hustle. So speaking of hustle, when you're getting past this night f- life photography gig like project, mm-hmm. what what is the evolution of your career? in Shanghai. Like, are you working on video at the same time? Because yeah. you're, you're a photographer and a, like a, a filmmaker, I would say. So like, right. I think you start out with photography, but you evolve into filmmaking. Yeah. So it was always, um, like photography is always pretty, uh, badly paid. Mm, yeah. But then video was suddenly like a bigger project and you get paid a few hundred dollars more. Mm. Because you'll be busier for, you know, uh, a few days trying to edit a shitty nightlife video together. Yeah. Because um, you can add video. Like, for people who don't know, there's, like, line items, basically. And you just say, like, a day of shooting and then a day of editing. It's like, right. just a way to make your 
budget bigger, I guess. Yeah. So it's still not a lot of money, but it's just adding on to stuff to do during the day when you're not at the club drinking. Mm. Yeah. Um, so that just gradually grew into building a video portfolio. A big problem with that was that I was still just being pigeonholed as a nightlife guy. Right. And no one wants to hire the guy who does nightlife videos for their corporate interview session. Yeah. So it slowly like built and then started doing other stuff for free, of course. Yeah. Because the only way to build portfolio is just to, you know, offer yourself and build your portfolio doing stuff either for yourself or for other people for free. Mm -hmm. So it did have been a bit of like fashion short documentary bits for whatever startup was willing to <laughs> hire me. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, started building a portfolio, started getting slightly bigger projects. Um, and at the moment, mostly just focusing on camera work because mm -hmm. the good thing with video is that you can sort of expand to a team where you can just focus on one thing compared to the photography, um, uh, role where you're basically doing everything by yourself. Hmm. Yeah. Unless you're a massive photographer, you're not going to have like a, a, like a solid team behind you with lighting yeah. and, you know, many assistants or yeah, with video, that's an interesting way to look at it. Like the amount of roles in video production compared to photography is just, there's like so many more roles in video right. production. And you can make a very, you can make a good professional photograph all by yourself mm -hmm. with video. It's basically impossible to do something that's uh, like commercial grade video if you're all by yourself. Yeah, that's true. But but you, it's funny, more and more now you'll see people being able to achieve amazing things by themselves. Right. Like, for example, like Patrick Wallner does some, some really dope stuff with visual traveling, mm -hmm. like just going around with just the way he operates. And you know, even on YouTube, like there's travel vloggers and whether you like the content they produce or not, the quality is impressive. Like just with today's technology, yeah. I guess. It's really what you're trying to achieve with it. Mm -hmm. Cause if you really enjoy doing everything in the process, then that's great. Mm -hmm. But for example, I don't particularly like editing. Mm -hmm. So if I can outsource that to someone else without having to pay him out of my own pocket, then mm. that's perfect. Yeah. Why not? Yeah. I personally don't like editing either. Yeah. I like editing my own stuff. I, I, I like if it's my own story and I don't have a client particularly mm -hmm. great, no problem. But when, you know, <laughs> the client is very picky and it just becomes more of like, it's just editing is not for me, I guess. Yeah. But, um, and it's also for something to really like specialize in. Mm, yeah, yeah. So you're not a master of none. Mm -hmm. So you find yourself trying to specialize more towards video after like, is there a time period that we're in right now? I'm just trying to get a gauge. Uh, or... Just at the moment, even I'm just trying to specialize in the cinematography part mm. of things. Well, I mean, like you've been doing it for a while. Like what was one of your biggest for your first like solid video projects you think you worked on? Like if you could date it back. I think... Probably the Everest documentary. Oh, okay. Yeah. What time, What around time, what time was that? 2015. Okay. Yeah. And this is a pretty heavy one. So I, I'd love, I guess we can get into it right now, the, the Mount Everest experience. Yeah. So the whole thing with video is you can, it seems like you can try all you want and have a great portfolio. You still have to get lucky and know the right people to get past the gigs that you really want to do. Mm. So then in this case... Um, they were looking for a cinematographer to make this long uh, documentary about uh, a group of female climbers trying to conquer Mount Everest. Mm -hmm. And first the gig was offered to um, a cinematographer, Richie, who just couldn't do it because it was a like two month commitment mm -hmm. for not that much money. And then um, he passed it to a friend of mine who lost his passport, oh, no. so he couldn't go. Okay. And then last minute, I got offered the gig. It's like, hey, would you like to do this gig and, you know, get paid to go to Nepal and film people climbing Mount Everest? So there's, you know, not much 
uh, that I would say no to right. at that point. Yeah. Um, so it was, um, of course, a challenge to start with because I felt like I was a bit in over my head using all these cameras that I've never used and on a, I guess, my first big or bigger budget documentary shoot. Mm-hmm. Um, but it all went well. I guess the hardest part with that was just the physical strain of hauling gear up to 5,000 500 meters. Yeah, that's crazy. Did you have any other team with you, like camera assistants or? Um, we went with a pretty big team, which included like two drone pilots that couldn't even make it to base camp because they got altitude sickness. Really? So there was a lot of pressure for me to uh, not get sick yeah. and jeopardize the whole thing. Sure. Um, so yeah, just that part was tough enough. And then, let me see. So it was a pretty big team. We were filming a team of five women Mm -hmm. who were in an expedition of maybe 10 climbers plus like probably eight to 10 Sherpas. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, so we got to base camp about a week in. Because it takes takes a good week to get from Kathmandu to base camp and acclimatize along the way. Okay, yeah. Because you got to go kind of slowly up, right? You can't just yeah. send it straight up. You have to, um, your body has to adjust to the altitude that you're at. Yeah, you fly in at around 2,500 meters mm-hmm. and then you go up like 700 meters every day. Mm. And then see if you, your body can, you know, adjust in time. Sure. Because if you don't adjust in time, you just have to, like, go back or take it a lot slower. Mm, and that's what happened to the drone pilots. They yeah. just have to go slower, yeah. And other people on the team as well. Like our editor. We had an editor on site who also got sick and had to mm. just go back to Kathmandu. So in the end, we had to send dailies back and forth between... Yeah. Base camp in Kathmandu. Yeah, that's such a logistical um, endeavor. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like a normal shoot when you're all in the same altitude, but now you have like different parts of the team on different. <laughs> right, <laughs> that's sending crazy. stuff back by helicopter. Dude, wild. Um, so yeah, uh, we got to base camp a week later, then spent about a week there. Um, just a lot of downtime, mm. sitting, reading books, trying to feel normal. Sure. While you're at this crazy altitude trying to breathe and, you know, shitting in a bucket. Yeah. And do you have any experience hiking or climbing, (laughs) really? I've done a lot of, like, hiking before, but nothing that's really high altitude. Yeah. And it's really hard to predict whether your body is going to adjust to that based on just, you know, physiological Mm. uh, status. And if you, you know, smoke, drink... Uh, exercise enough but at that point I was holding up pretty well Um, we did some like basic climbing training um, and I was just filming that in the meantime Mm. just like a few hours a day of climbing training I wasn't gonna go up to Everest myself yeah just because I just don't have the experience to you know walk ahead of the crowd and try and film them coming up Mm. letting them pass and then filming them yeah (laughs) and then catching up with them again yeah so that would have been too difficult and i was helping a a sherpa to train him to do all the filming stuff for me Mm. because another thing of that is that you need really expensive permits to go up everest sure and for sherpas it's all like included in the expedition. Yeah. So they're already going to be there. Why hire, hire extra cameramen when they could potentially just hit record for yeah. simple shots. If, if I'm getting right. it right. Yeah. Ideally the shots would be, you know, at a professional level, but that would just complicate things so much more. Right. Cause they're just adding so many people to the team to yeah. in front and behind 
and right. in the middle at the same time. And and it's a it's a very specific job to be high altitude, mm. you know, cinematographer. Yeah, jeez. And there's only one climbing season on Everest, so most mm. of them are pretty busy. Damn. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, there's probably other groups of people filming at the same time. Yeah, we. I mean, uh, that's like May, early uh, end of uh, end of April, early May at Everest Base Camp is the busiest time of the year. Mm. So there's just thousands of tents and hundreds of teams mm. waiting for their their summit push, and apparently you couldn't fly drones anyways because another team got their drone confiscated. Really. Because it's a helicopter landing zone. Oh, I mean, so. that's pretty serious, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, John couldn't have worked anyways. Mm. Um, so, yeah, then about a week in, that really big earthquake in Nepal hit. 8.1 magnitude earthquake. Yeah. So, when that happens, so the whole base camp is on a glacier and you don't, you hear the glacier crack and move the whole time mm. and it's slowly like moving by itself. But then once that earthquake hits, we didn't quite know what was going on and if it was actually what was happening. Mm. And then next thing we know, there's this huge rumbling sound. And that morning everything was like completely covered in clouds. So we mm. couldn't really see much around us. But we hear this huge cracking, crumbling sound, uh, which was like a piece of ice that was breaking off one of the uh, really high cliffs right mm -hmm. above us. True. So a huge piece of ice fell off and created an avalanche that rolled over base camp. Mm -hmm. And we were unlucky enough to be at the very edge of base camp. Um, so... I guess we got hit the hardest. Yeah. And then, yeah, I got hit in the head with something. Can't really remember much of the moment itself, except for just waking up and not being able to move much. Jeez. Because I broke, or like I cracked a couple of uh, spinal discs. Mm. Um, people were thinking that I might have like broken my back. So I wasn't allowed to move. And they tied me to a board, like a just a styrofoam board. Yeah. Wasn't allowed to move. And then we weren't aware of what was going on in Kathmandu either. Mm. So we're just waiting and waiting for any signal. Nothing. Um, and it was too cloudy for helicopters to go anywhere. So I basically had to spend the first day and night at like a medical tent with all the other seriously injured people yeah um waiting to get evacuated so then after the last the longest 20 hours of my life <sighs> finally got sent out to the next camp mm -hmm. and then triage next camp another triage and then we finally got to Kathmandu with uh most of the team and then there found out that most of Kathmandu is destroyed <sighs> and yeah, just a chaotic ride through town trying to find a hospital for us to get uh, uh, to get put in to the ER. Yeah. Um, yeah, once we found one, the big problem was that um, our team got split up because they couldn't find enough space for everyone to be together. Yeah. So then I got sent to one hospital. Other people got sent to another Um bunch of aftershocks in between mm. so it was all just pure chaos um at least they had plenty of morphine so i don't <laughs> remember much of the first yeah. like two three days there Jeez. so you're held there for a while yeah they were just trying to figure out how to evacuate um mostly the foreigners mm. and then at some point there was a emergency plane that was going to belgium <laughs> with a whole bunch of like all the Belgian tourists that were in Nepal at that moment. Dude, that's such a bizarre experience. Yeah. Like you're being categorized by your country and just like, right. Wow. Um, well at that point the pilot decided that I was not stable enough to fly all the way to Belgium. Oh, 
So the plane dropped me off in New Delhi. Oh, New Delhi. Yeah. Um, with no one else. Damn. So it was just me on the runway on a stretcher and I wasn't allowed to move. What? And You're dropped I, off with like anyone to pick you up or? Just an ambulance with oh like a bunch God. of dudes that don't speak a word of English and yeah. just drove me to a hospital. Um, once I got to the hospital, they were considering like doing spinal surgery, Sp which luckily they didn't do. Oh my God. Um, yeah. Also back in, in Kathmandu, because I got, I got hit in the head with like a piece of rock or whatever. Rock and or ice or something. Yeah. Yeah. It cut open my face, uh, above my, well, across my eyebrow. Yeah. And they stitched it up pretty roughly um i thought i might have lost my eye because i couldn't see anything because it was so swollen mm. um but yeah taped that all up got to delhi luckily they didn't do any surgery mm -hmm. and then two days later i got another plane from delhi to istanbul and then istanbul to brussels finally so I finally got back to Brussels um, like f four or five days later. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's like pretty rough to hear what the family's been through because they only hear bits and pieces and, you so know. Like your family. Yeah. Yeah. They don't know anything that's going on. Well, they know like bits and pieces because luckily enough, um, the director of the documentary was in Kathmandu and not base camp when the earthquake happened. Mm. So he was able to sort of direct all the, you know, the team to hospitals and such. Yeah. And he was able to get in touch with my family and inform them about the situation. Wow. Um, yeah. Then hearing later from my family, the amount of uh, trouble they went through of just trying to get in touch and trying to get me back home. Yeah. I mean, you're um, basically unconscious for most of this or unreachable. Like you said, you're on morphine. Yeah. Like you don't know what's going on. You're being thrown from country to country. Right. And, so in, in India, I arrived with just uh, a hospital gown and my passport. <sighs> oh, yeah. And the only reason I went to India was because I happened to have an Indian visa in my passport. That was one of <laughs> my strange questions, like, as you're telling this story is like, what's the visa situation like? Do, do they... <laughs> Yeah, that was the only reason I went to India. Wow. Otherwise, dude. I would have gladly skipped that one. Yeah, man. That I mean, like, not to knock India, but I don't think they have, like, top-notch medical services. I'm like, yeah. thank God they didn't do spinal surgery. And, like, did did it turn out you didn't need spinal surgery or? Yeah, I didn't need it. You just didn't need it. You, um, did you, you said you broke some discs or something? Or Yeah, which uh, which wasn't, like, too bad. I didn't. I just did, like, physiotherapy. But okay. I didn't need surgery because there was no, like, nerve damage. Okay. Um, yeah, they were just really stingy with the morphine in India. Oof. So that was the, the big downside. Damn. Not trying to take care of that pain. No. And that was the good thing about Kathmandu is that they just gave me enough morphine to sleep through all the aftershocks and right. whatever surgeries they did oh on my, my face. God. So, like, I've heard bits and pieces of this story, but I did not really know the details and that is just like the, the chaos of what happens after. Like I right. really didn't think about that when I've heard what this, what happened. I heard, I thought like, Oh, like you survived and like you're more or less dealing with the trauma and like, like somehow I, I don't even know what I was thinking. Like somehow you're just stable and like things right. work out. Well, like that madness of how like a place like Kathmandu will operate. Yeah. Of course they're not going to be able to operate top notch. Like, they're not a first world country, right? Like they right. don't have the, the infrastructure. They don't have like none of that I considered. Yeah. And especially with the aftershocks, like when an aftershocks happen, people just like evacuate from the hospital. Oh yeah. And they just leave people yeah. in the emergency room. I mean, like you got to be a, a hero doctor to really want to stay behind. Right. And, like, damn, that's, yeah, you get, <sighs> the resources become so few and far between yeah. once that happens. Man, so... I mean, th does this change the way you look at, first of all, like near, near death experience? Like, is, is that something you think about? Like, does, does, do you think it changed you much afterwards? 
Not really. Yeah. Um, mostly because I was already like doing what I wanted to do. So mm-hmm. there was no like change in course of life. That's an interesting way to look at like most people, if they had a near death experience, maybe if you were in a corporate job mm-hmm. and you were like, kind of like bummed on life, like you would switch things up, but like yeah. you were already going for it. Like you were, this right. happened on Mount Everest. It wasn't like a car accident where you were yeah. driving to an office. Right. That's interesting. Yeah. And then also, I mean, what about changing the way you travel? Like, I guess like, or risk assessment like that. Mm. It's pretty crazy to just like do uh, avalanches or I guess it's an 8.1 magnitude earthquake. That is huge. Yeah. So it's just like roll the dice. Like that just happens. You you can't really look out for those things. I think the first, well, it's not really PTSD, but hearing like thunder rumbling Mm. for the first, one or two years was pretty yeah. unsettling. Dude, because I saw the footage. Like, they have it. I didn't see the the dock. And by the way, for people who are wondering, the dock is called Too High to Fall. Yeah. And so, obviously, they're going into it, filming something completely different, and then it ends up being probably, I'm guessing, a story about this avalanche. Yeah. Um, and someone was filming as stuff was starting to come down. Yeah. So it was the, filmed by some, I think, German guy. Okay. Who... Um, we were able to get the footage from mm. for the documentary because I was, I think I, I put the camera down and I was not expecting anything to happen for the rest of the day because most of the day you're just sitting there and reading books. Okay. So when you hear the glacier crack, it's something you can't really capture on camera anyways. Mm. So it's not really worth like picking up and setting up a shot because you're going to be too late anyways. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just like kind of mind boggling to think. Um, yeah. And then, so you just like, you were in your tent or you were kind of like, you hear the stuff and you can yeah. like, exit. And from what I remember, cause it's all a bit vague, um, getting out of the tent, seeing, you know, stuff coming at us and then running for cover. Mm. But then gets a little squirrely cause I don't of quite course. know what happened. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I got I got lucky because a lot of other people didn't. People died, right? Yeah, I think total of like twenty plus people. That's 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 hard to hear, and I guess for like just imagining myself being in the situation of um, surviving and then knowing other people died, that's just a a heavy one to handle. Like, yeah, well, especially uh, yeah, it was strange because. It's people that, you know, you have dinner with the night before and you hear their life story and then all of a sudden they're just gone. And then I, yeah, I didn't really get um, much detail when stuff was happening, but Mm -hmm. then hearing some accounts from the Sherpas later on about just how gruesome it was is unsettling. Yeah, man, I actually was when I was looking through your Instagram, I did see, you know, there's one photo you have on there and then like 20 comments of just like, Oh my God, I heard what happened. Like, are you okay? Like wild to think yeah, that one can experience that. But yeah. man, thank God. I mean, made it through it and moved on. So after that, what's like recovery? Like you spend a while back home or just kind um, of, yeah, I went, so after I got back, I think I spent about two months just recovering at home. Mm. And then I just got really, really bored. Yeah. Because there's only so much Netflix you can watch. <laughs> um, so then I went back to Shanghai a little bit earlier than I should have just because I had to do something. And being in the suburbs of Antwerp isn't really doing much for my mental health. Sure, sure. Um, so I just went back to Shanghai. And the next couple of months just spent a lot of time partying. Yeah. Just living it up. Sure. Um, kind of just getting back to normal life, you know, yeah. like get over it. You move past it. And, right. And then it's back. Cause you do a ton of traveling after that. Like I, as I was going through your Instagram, there is so much, like we can pick up the phones now and kind of scroll a little bit and maybe we can get to, I don't know. There's, there's one thing I wanted to ask. It was, um, the, the the film you made uh Buzakashi 
Oh. Is that how you pronounce it? Buskashi. Buskashi. Yeah, I don't. I don't particularly have a photo in there, but it was. Um, dude, that doc or that's that's more of a short piece mm-hmm. of just like. Can you explain to people what is going on in that piece? Yeah. So it's like a a popular Central Asian sport, mm. <laughs> which is kind of like rugby but on horses, and instead of a rugby ball, it's a goat carcass. Yeah. Bizarre. Yeah, and it's one of those things that you. S- I found bits and pieces of online and some photos, mm. but it also didn't quite capture what it would be like seeing it in person. Mm. So found out that it was mostly happening around one certain time of the year in a certain place mm. in Tajikistan. So, you know, decided to just go check it out, yeah. bring the camera, see what happens. Yeah. Did you meet many of the locals or is it also just a big language barrier thing? And, um, uh, yeah, I, I got a fixer just to make it easier. And these, these games are, were not easy to find because you mm-hmm. have to like go ask the locals and drive oh, into yeah. the mountains. It's an amazing amount of people on horses though. It yeah. just seems like it, someone should die every time. Just like people falling off the horses. Yeah, like, people it, do get injured. Chaos, like massive chaos. Right. There's, yeah, for anyone wondering, to go watch the piece, and it, it's just like uh, it looks like medieval times. <laughs> yeah, like they they like it doesn't make sense like how they're just like doing this with it's just casual for them. Yeah, I think the nice part is that a lot of them are wearing Russian tank helmets, mm. which adds to the aesthetic. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's a real vibe. But yeah, dude, just like so. Can you maybe try and explain the goal again? Like I, I didn't fully get it when I was watching it. Like the the goal is to take a dead goat and drag it across the field, or and then people are intercepting it, or right. You just basically need to grab the goat from the ground up, yeah. and then try and deposit it into like a goal post area. Yeah. And that's yeah. I mean, and then like, you score, and then every time. Like when you score, you can win something. Uh, so sometimes it's just cash or like a new TV. Sure, casual. Yeah, yeah. new TV for dead goat in the in the bucket. <laughs> yeah, whatever people want. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Oh, I mean, I don't know about funny, but it's interesting. Like one one time I was traveling. Uh, I forget exactly where it was. It was Airbnb project, and um, they were building Airbnb houses. I think uh, close to Guilin, maybe or that area and they would do these like community like you know like maybe in america we have like county fairs and stuff like that for them a county fair was like running through the um you know the you know in indonesia they have the the layers of what is it called rice patties yeah they would like run through the rice patties and do tug of war and they would have all these and they would involve animals in it in strange ways like throw chickens off the cliff and they would kind of fly and if you catch it like you win the chicken and that that's your prize like to take it home and it's funny or interesting how like these like i guess asian cultures are using animals the ways they do yeah to to go about and yeah i think it it is what keeps travel interesting just to see stuff that you wouldn't even imagine would be a thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Animal cruelty is a whole other thing that we can get into. Yeah. But no, I'm not too is. interested in talking about that. I just think it's like, I'm not going to fully understand their culture. Yeah. They won't fully understand mine. That's for me. That's what it is. Right. Like it is just all look, especially when I'm traveling, I'm just trying to look at everything from a very open perspective. Right. However weird it might be. Definitely on your, on your website. One, one thing you say kind of about yourself, which I like, and I, I feel like I do as well. You're, you're driven to record human stories around the world. And for me, like even when I started Shanghai observed, it's like, it's about being, um, objective. Like there, there's, I want to be not subjective at all. I don't right. really want to like paint their story. I want to document it and let them tell their story. Yeah. Cause there's a lot of really polarizing stuff out there, mm. but it would be injustice to the culture. However you might perceive it, um, to document it in a way that's not objective. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Any other, um, stories about traveling around like and working with brands or anything? Um, it's so like one of the weird travel stories is like, for example, a region in Indonesia where 
uh, once every couple of years, they take out their dead relatives from their graves and oh. dust them off and change their clothing. Wow. And like an annual thing or? Uh, every three years, I think. Wow. I never heard of this. Yeah. So that's also one of those things that, you know, you can look at from different perspectives, but if it's, you know, tradition, then mm. it's just interesting enough to see how other people deal with death, for example. Yeah. Yeah. My friend said he was documenting, a, a, I guess, a funeral ceremony in somewhere in Southwest China or Central China. And they carry the body like all the way up the mountain mm. and um, it's a long process to deal with it. And then also even Jay was talking about funeral ceremony, about how they, uh, they burn like houses here in yeah. China. I don't know if you've ever seen that, but like sometimes you'll see like it's a toy house, someone carrying it down the street right. or on the back of a bike and yeah. And they burn it and they also burn money and yeah. So many different ways to deal with it. How'd you get that? How'd you get that one? Um, to shoot, did you shoot it or photograph it or, um, uh, I took photos. Hmm. Um, it was, quite a while back and then eventually was able to sell it to vice mm. but then of course it didn't pay me enough to even cover my flight ticket damn yeah that's uh that's that's yeah. doc life i guess yeah it's just one of those things that even if you don't get paid enough you sh should probably still do it because otherwise someone else is just going to take it mm. yeah and if it's interesting enough then just going there and seeing things for yourself is worth it I think. Yeah. So uh, before we start to wrap up, I, I am interested to talk about, a little bit about um, High Horse, which mm -hmm. is, a, I guess, a, a production company you kind of started. And so how did that come to be? Around what time did that did that happen? I think that was 2014-ish. Okay. And so um, do, you, do you have a buddy and you just kind of wanted to like kind of brand your business? Or? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's about scaling what you do because mm. a lot of times... Um, if you want to work with brands or agencies directly, they wouldn't hire an individual by themselves. They would always just go through a production house. Sure. So we had the idea of starting a production house, get bigger projects, mm. and then sort of, you know, um, build a brand name for yourself and eventually have the goal of just getting a certain type of gigs mm -hmm. that you want to be doing rather than, you know, the gigs that pay enough to get by. Yeah. Or pay well even. Sure, sure. Yeah, having a brand behind you just makes all the difference in the world. Yeah. It's kind of interesting. Like also because then you're not um you're building like a yeah, that brand name rather than name for yourself. Right. Which can grow to like a bigger size than you are by mm -hmm. yourself. But yeah, for me, even like there's there's so much of a difference, like the work that goes on behind the scenes of a brand and, you know, maintaining things. Did you find that it was like a stress on your creativity or did, did, uh, yeah. And that's one of the reasons why I, I left in the end mm -hmm. is because running a brand, you're still going to end up doing more stuff on the business side rather than the creative. Um, and in the end, I just want to shoot. I don't want to go to, like business meetings and mm. do business development. Right. So I felt like that just sort of took away from what I wanted to do at a point that's also critical in my career to develop those skills. Yeah. So, you know, spending five days a week at the office trying to edit a video that I don't care about yeah. doesn't really help my, you know, sense of purpose for even just being in Shanghai because you're so far away from home mm. doing stuff that you could be doing anywhere else. Yeah, I totally agree. So moving forward, what what do you got on the horizon? What are you looking forward to? Um, Cause I know you told me that um, you're not going to be spending as much time in Shanghai. Like you yeah. kind of will be based a little further South. Did you say, or yeah. So we're going to be, Based, me and my wife will be based in Saigon hmm. and then just coming back to Shanghai for work because right. I still have my my contacts and network here. Of course. Um, but it's just time to do something new and refreshing. Yeah. Been in Shanghai for eight years now. Hmm. And I hear Vietnam is and like kind of Thailand and Southeast Asia, like these areas are the next 
kind of places where like, you, you know, industry is starting to form or do you have much experience being there so far or is it uh, fresh to you? Yeah. It's been like two weeks now. So yeah. So it's very fresh. Trying to, to figure it out. Um, I think China does have that, the lure of just having a lot of money for everything. Mm. So trying to lower expectations in terms of budget, but um, having higher expectations in terms of creativity is uh, my goal eventually. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm looking forward to see what you get going on out there and yeah. follow, follow up. Stay tuned. Uh, where can people reach you at if they wanted to get in touch or maybe follow what you're doing, like Instagram, website, that kind of stuff? Yeah, I think Instagram would be the, the easiest way. Mm. It's just at Mark Ressong check my email occasionally yeah but instagram is just the way to go at this moment awesome all right mark thanks so much for being on yeah thanks for having me all right peace guys boom that's it thank you so much for listening if you found this podcast valuable there are many ways you can support it you can rate and review it on itunes stitcher or wherever you listen you can share it with your friends you can blog about it or discuss it on your own podcast if you're watching on youtube you can subscribe to this channel and like the video or you can support it directly. You can do this by going to my website. I'll leave a link in the description. Thank you for supporting the show. Listeners like you make it possible. Also, if you enjoyed the intro and outro music, it was made by my brother, Danny Greenberg. You can go and check out his beats at soundcloud.com slash Estoric, E-S-T-O-R-I-C. Okay, that's it for now. Peace.